Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great to see you all and online as well as in person. And uh, I, I say this every time, but I'm going to say it. I think we have a really good uh, program for you today. Uh, we'll be talking about policy and um, lots of data. So we're looking at sustainability within the logistics and transportation sector. Um, for the Inland Empire, and really coming from a, a policy perspective, but also a data perspective, so what it's telling you. Um, I'm Kimberly Collins. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Leonard Transportation Center. And um, again, we have a really great show, but we'll start with a welcome from one of our um, great friends and sponsors, Matt Bushman from HNTB. If, Matt, if you'd like to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Kimberly. Um... So my name is Matt Bushman. I'm the Inland Empire Group Director for HNTB. HNTB is a transportation engineering company that uh, focuses on really all types of transportation, and, and that's it. So we support SBCTA, we support RCTC, Ontario, Brightline West, and a number of projects here in the Inland Empire. Um, we're one of the founding partners, as you mentioned, of this dialogue series, and we're just looking forward to uh, the conversations today and appreciate the speakers who were able to come out. Thank you. HNTB has been a really great partner um, in providing content, contacts, a little bit of money, that's always good, um, and support uh, for creating all of our programming. And we have um, for you uh, the Spark link, which has the full program with all the speakers' bios and everything there. So we'll provide that, that link in a minute. Next, I'd like to welcome up uh, the chair of my department, new to the region, Dr. Robert Stokes, to say a couple words on behalf of the university. Yeah, so I moved here 11 months ago from uh, Chicago, and before that, I lived in Philadelphia, where I'm from. I got a PhD in urban planning at Rutgers, which is in a region that looks a little bit like this <laughs> sometimes. Um, and about Kind of 10 years ago, uh, when I was at Drexel as a professor, we had done a lot of work related to sustainability for the city. They had produced their sustainability plan while we were there. We helped them produce it. During that time, we, I was a co-teacher of a class uh, called the Vital Systems of Cities. And so it was a really good eye-opener for me because planning could be a lot of things. But ultimately, what it is is looking at the infrastructure and its connection to uh, human habitats and how everything works uh, not just in a city, but in a region. And this region presents a lot of interesting uh, <laughs> connections related to that. And I was really interested in the theme of today's uh, uh, session um, because talking about something as an inland port is a relatively unique concept in human history. <laughs> so I think what you guys are talking about is something that's, uh, that's quite interesting to academics as well. So in that course, we read Abel Woolman's uh, pretty seminal article called the, the Metabolism of Cities. So that, you know, that's a metaphor that a region or a city is a metabolic <laughs> entity, which brings things in, it, it does things to them, and it, and it creates energy coming out. And so while it's an imperfect metaphor, this is not a, you know, a larger human body here in the Inland Empire, it is one that, that really can help you formulate how sustainability works. Because as, as the metaphor of metabolism, that's how uh, sustainability studies at the core of, of that concept. Um, as an inland port, uh, this uh, economic empire <laughs> that we, uh, uh, we're currently sitting in uh, does serve a very important metabolic function, and not just for the cities that are you know, around it, for the state of California and for the nation. So some thoughts there about the importance of this, um, uh, of this region. Um, and about a decade ago, in terms of uh, also working with sustainability, I wrote a number of papers about sustainability. And it's a pretty slippery concept, right? Because it does, depending on what you would, one of the three legs of the stool you want to focus on, whether equity, economy, or... And so the environment, I think, is something to focus on in this region. And I'll get to that in two seconds. Um, but the issue with sustainability also, again, talking about an inland port in a, in a regional con construct, uh, it's slippery because it, it scale matters, right? How you conceive how something is sustainable really matters about what scale you're conceiving at. And so while, while something may be completely unsustainable at the local level, it may be more sustainable at a regional or certainly state or national level. Uh, you see a lot of conflicts over land use, 
uh, relate it to things that have, you know, a lot of <laughs> externalities, right? It localized externalities. And those localized externalities cause political problems for people and elected officials who live near these local externalities like the inland port. But ultimately, um, people on a higher articulation have to think about the importance of, like I said, this, this economic engine for the state and the country in order to reflect some of the policies they direct towards this region to make up for some of the costs that local uh, citizens have to put up with related to having such a, an active uh, economic entity here. Thinking about that, which is how to create a, a, a stronger political dialogue, that is if this is going to be here for the next 30 years and grow, uh, continue to grow, uh, what are we going to do to actually make the people who live here happier with that fact? <laughs> so, um, so that's a job for people that are have much higher pay scale than me. But thank you. So thank you so much. I would like to really thank um, again Matt Bushman and and HNTB for all that they've done for us. I'd also like to um, we're going to thank him. We're going to invite him up here in a moment. But um, the fourth district supervisor Kurt Hagman here today to start us off today. So I'm I'm really excited to have him here and see him again. You came a bit ago for one of our dialogues because this is year five that we've been doing them. So it's uh, we have a lot. We have a, a lot of great information. Um, I'd also like to thank Aaron Rogers, who's sitting in the back, who came in and, and has joined us for graciously hosting us and allowing us to, um, you know, use their facilities here as we've moved from fully online um, to now sort of a hybrid format. So we have folks online, of course, and everyone here in the room. So thank you, Omnitrans, um, for, for hosting us. And then uh, I'd like to really thank all of our esteemed speakers who will be here today and, and to share information. We have two of our students who will be in and sharing some of the research that the LTC is doing. So it's great to have them here as well. Um, and then finally, I'd like to really thank our planning committee, um, all the members from Omnitrans, Foothill Transit, um, San Bernardino Valley College, HNTB, the San Bernardino International Airport. And of course, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, the Platinum Sponsors, HNTB, Ontario International Airport, the San Bernardino International Airport, and San Bernardino Valley College, our gold sponsors, Southern California, uh, Southern California Gas, and Woodruff, Sprayden, and Smart. And then we have a number of silver sponsors who have been great and really um, supported this activity. So we, we thank you all for, for your support. Um, with that, we'd like to start before we invite the supervisor up with our first poll question. So for those of you who have been here before, we start off with a, I don't know, a lead, right? Just to kind of get people to start thinking about the activity, because this really is a dialogue. We want you to engage with the conversation. Can't help it. It's the educator hat that we wear. Um, we're not here just to have a webinar and be a bunch of talking heads, but we really want folks to engage with the material and take it with them and go out and, and make and make change. So which policy do you think would be most effective in promoting sustainability within the Inland Empire's transportation and logistics industry? Now, of course, you know, we just lob them out there. It's not a real difficult question, nor is it scientific, but <laughs> Uh, tax incentives for companies adopting green technologies, stricter emission standards for vehicles, investment in renewable energy for transportation, implementing congestion pricing um, during peak traffic hours, and then all of the above. And I could probably guess what the answer is going to be. All right. So we have all of the above. What a, it's not a big surprise, but really thinking about um, you know, everything that we can do. And it's a, I, from a policy perspective, and I teach policy, we do these multiple policies to, to be able to deal with these issues. All right, thank you so much. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to invite up our first speaker um, from the fourth district, Supervisor Kurt Hagman. Supervisor Hagman. While we talk policy, I get the honor of making policy for the last 20 years. Uh, so I want to get a little bit of perspective. I was a local council member, mayor, for four years, I was a state legislator for six years, termed out and came to the county of San Bernardino nine years ago. And I basically sit on every board and commission that makes public policy at this point. So I sit on Omnitrans, so I'm very happy to be here. I, um, I sit on SBCTA, which is our transportation authority. I sit on Ontario International Airport as a commissioner. And I sit on SCAG as its vice president, which is Southern California Association of Governments. I sit on AQMD board. Um, 
and so on and so on. And actually sit on a, a board for IEHP, which is our healthcare system. So we talk about the effects of our residents. We see it from different angles. And as a board member for those and probably 20 other boards I sit on, besides the board of supervisor, we always have to wear different hats. So there's never one clean answer, not one clean perspective to solve an issue. Then you got to look at what we are. And I think that's an important part when we talk about public policy. We sit in California, what, the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world now, and we have one eighth of the population of the United States here. And in Southern California, two thirds of that population nestled in Southern California. So we're a little bit different. And it's hard to have a one size fit all policy when you're looking at a region that is very unique and different. Um, one of the conversations I had my colleagues in AQMD just last week was, we're held to the clean air standards nationally, federally, and everyone has the right to clean air, the same amount of air, but it's a little bit different when you have that high concentration of population and the geographical mountains, as you see around here, that kind of holds the air in. Top that off as a policymaker, when you sit on AQMD, we don't have the authority to regulate sh um, ships, planes, heavy trucks, um, and airplanes which creates that environment. So how are you supposed to get to that standard when you can't regulate that standard? Or should we force the federal government to be a lower standard for all when they don't have the problems in 98% of the rest of the country that we have here in Southern California? So these are the things that we have to do. And what does that mean as we work for those attainment goals? Was it due to our local economy? And now I've already lost my notes, but I know that 40% of, uh, of our imports for the United States come from the ports of Long Beach and LA. And we have 30% of the exports to those ports. And uh, when you look at San Bernardino County, we're the largest geographical county in the United States, 22,000 square miles, larger than nine states geographically, and larger than 13 or 14 states in population, just our county alone. So we're very unique as well. And it's always had a problem with one-size-fit-all policies because we're not one-size-fit-all geographically, people-wise, or anything like that. We have a unique economy. One out of eight of my Inland Empire residents work in supply chain of some sort. So it's a big economy that's continuing to grow. Um, we're showing that um, we had over 851,000 tons of on, at Ontario airports. So I put that commissioner hat on and say that we're one of the fastest growing um, airports in the United States right now. Um, we have over 5.7 million passengers and like I said, coming on 900,000 tons of cargo. And during COVID, that increased exponentially. We always see that increase during holiday shopping time. At Christmas, we have a big push. And the demand is still increasing. And it's not just our local demand. It is national demand. And we're that input, we're that inland um, feed for the rest of the country. So when you wear these different hats, you got to make different decisions and different rules coming from federal and state. It makes it a complicated way to go. And I would say we're also in the time period of transformation. And I could say from Omnitran point of view, over the last eight years, nine years I've been on this committee, we went from diesel to natural gas buses. Now we're doing transition to electric and also hydrogen. And I went to the conference a few weeks ago for the bigger trucks and everything like that. Uh, what is that? What does that crystal ball tell us? What is really going to be that last technology of clean air for bigger vehicles? And then the manufacturers can really tell you. It's really emerging right now, which is exciting, but also you can imagine the expense passed on to these businesses here locally that's not passed on to other parts of the region because they don't have those clean air problems. So for us as policymakers, how much do we push that agenda forward at what cost can we handle in the local economy before we start exporting those businesses someplace else? Now, many of my residents will say, well, that's great. Let's get rid of everything out here. Let's move everything to the high desert, Nevada or Arizona. But think about that logistics going from those cargo ports in Long Beach to LA, which is hard to put maybe in Nevada. I don't think you put a big shipping container or port in the middle of Nevada. So you have that transportation of those vehicles back and forth because the demand is still here local in Southern California too with the one eighth of the population. So all these things is in balance and it's always evolving with the latest rules and regulations with the latest technologies and you know each different border policymaker has to make those decisions based on what's in front of us and what hat we're wearing. Um, so AKMD puts a lot of money into technology, which I'm, I'm a futurist. I love technology. I love seeing where the future brings. And so we're help sponsor some of the new companies that want to go fully electric on their trucks.
We just had a presentation about that last, last couple of weeks, which is exciting. But again, do we have the infrastructure to support all those new technologies? Many of my developers can't get their building started because the, the energy grid's not existing. I have one project is waiting three years for Edison to respond. Another one in Limport that's said that could take as much as six or seven years before the grid gets to where they want to put it on Barstow. So as we push these technologies forward, we as policymakers, local as well as county has to figure out where we're going to put the infrastructure to support that change in technology. And is it going to be energy, uh, electric? Is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be a combination of everything above? The cost that we bore as Omnitrans to switch from diesel to natural gas was immense to bring a natural gas line in here. And the neighbors, I mean, the residents weren't real happy we're bringing natural gas pipelines here. Get that done three years later, now we're saying we're going to electric. Well, to bring Edison or that kind of infrastructure here, we probably can't do that. So now we got to take our buses someplace else to charge. Let's not even try to bring hydrogen here because I think the neighbors go crazy when we try to bring hydrogen in this facility. So again, that infrastructure has to follow technology and the technology has to follow the regulations, but it all comes, what comes first, what comes second as we go forward. One of the things I've been pushing is for inland port myself. I think there's a, we could eliminate a lot of the, and I'll put my SBCTA hat on, which is the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority. You see all the freeway construction we're doing, the 10 freeway and, you know, the different on and off ramps and the lane ridings throughout the whole Southern California, which we're all competing to do, try and make larger freeways. But let's face it, freeways are very, very expensive. And uh, what you see is probably going to be it. We're not going to build any more freeways. We can improve maybe the traffic flow on surface streets, which we're trying to do smart signalization and do uh, traffic single timing through multiple jurisdictions. But freeways are too expensive and you have to take out too many homes to build more freeways. It's not going to happen. So how do we get that 40% of the cargo for the United States and 30% of exports to, to and from Long Beach and LA ports into an area that you could do like hubs and, and distribute that those goods throughout areas that can hold it to repackage it and reship throughout the United States. And that's why you see the warehouse growth throughout the Inland Empire and beyond right now. Um, so we're trying to look at where we could put an inland port and more importantly, how do we get that cargo from point A to point B? BSNF has a plan and they proposed an inland port in Barstow, but they put it on rail, pre-sort that containers on the ports drive it up on with their train up to the Inland Empire. Like I said, that has a long timetable just for the infrastructure. We could build warehouses pretty quickly, but the energy to get to it is going to take a long time as it stands right now. Is that the best technology to move that? Don't know because there's so many new things. We at uh, SBCTA is also looking at a um, underground tunneling system. You may have heard about the Boring Company project. They've already done a few of those in the, uh, Las Vegas for people. We're looking at a people mover from Rancho um, Cucamonga to Ontario Airport on the ground. I think we're in our final stages, hopefully going to hire someone pretty soon to actually build the tunnel. Um, that's for passengers, but I'm thinking, can we use that kind of technology underground to move cargo containers? The size would fit. What would you use for um, that um, mobility? Was it electric or something else to move it underground? Um, but if we are able to get an Inland Empire port, um, port and we're able to transfer the goods from Long Beach and Los Angeles in here, think about how many trucks that takes off our freeways. And the cars, when they move quicker, actually pollute less when they sit there and idle and go stop and go traffic like it was all weekend. Um, so these are things we're trying to plan for, but the technology is all very much emerging and we have to try out different test things. So there's different, lots of funding coming in for different things. And here locally is where we actually try to put those policies in effect. We are actually going through with some of these projects to look at them. And then there'll be test beds for the future of transportation, whether that's hydrogen, or electric, or whatever the next sustainable thing. But how fast we push on that accelerate to force our private sector businesses to deal with is, um, is the, always the, more of the debate. I think we'll get there eventually. Did we do it overnight? Did we do it over years or a decade? Um, because we need the infrastructure and the businesses that we pass on those costs to have to still stay competitive. Otherwise they go to our business and we lose that economy that we're working on. So there's always that balance on there. Um, I could keep going on because I have so many different hats, but I'd rather actually respond to questions you may have of me. How do local governments in the county respond to this dual demand for jobs and housing and 
yeah, the trade-offs between warehouses and, and as a you know as a public policy person, I would love to snap my fingers. Have all high-paying technology jobs. The reality, and we try to go solicit those companies to come here, to South California, and we have actually increased a lot of the manufacturing jobs in San Bernardino County. The regulation burden in California is much higher than most other states, so that makes it more difficult. We have the you know our air standards, we have the energy costs, we pay the highest electrical costs of any other state, and we have other those regulations that the state passes on that makes it very hard to be competitive. So it's it's a policy debate of do we still keep passing on more and more warehouses? How far away do they need to be from residents? What can we do to um, you know on each specific project to make it a little more uh, visually and, and for transportation wise for those vehicles, how they go. At the same time, my residents still want the same day delivery from Amazon. And so we need those hubs to have that, you know, goods close by so they can still get their same, same day or next day delivery. So it's, I think each in the individual one is looked as a, as a microcosm for that particular neighborhood. And if you talk about inland port, there's not too many places to put it. We're pretty much built out in the valleys, which is uh, South Ontario, that's already been zoned mostly housing, because we also are facing as public policy um, people is the arena numbers that the state passed on to us that says, any of you Redondo Beach, you still got to build 6,000 homes in Redondo Beach, but there's no vacant space. So each one of the cities are dealing with that. Yeah, and um, I get in public or affordable housing, that's a whole other mess. But, you know, so every uh, region is looking at how do we put our numbers of housing in Local government, let me just put it this way, we always have a gun to our head when that you're a city or a county um, by either the state or the federal government. Right now, we have 12 time clocks going on transportation projects from the EPA saying you're not hitting your clean air standards. And if you don't hit those clean air standards, we're going to stop your federal funding for transportation, which is basically things building all these freeways and stuff. Um, the state government says, well, local cities, if you don't meet your regional housing numbers, we're going to cut off your funding as well. So we have really no say in those public policies at the state or federal level. We just implement those policies, but sometimes it's very contradictory as far as the needs. Hello, there's um, a question in the chat from Jennifer Martin. Um, it is for, so it says, are there any plans to address the traffic in the Cajon Pass? Yes, there, there's plans. We actually have um, a rail, a high-speed rail, a private high-speed rail coming out and they're still proposing. I think they got some funding hopefully in this last round and we've been processing that through SBCTA. So we're looking for other modes of transportation. We all get in our cars as individuals. We're going to continue to have problems for a long time. But as we're a, a sprawled out urban area, we're not like a downtown and other places I visit around the world that's very dense in population. Those pu public transportation systems are very expensive and not as utilized as much because we're not those heavy concentrations of, of housing. We don't have any story, you know, residential apartment buildings that you go from one area to another where your work is. So we do have high speed rail plan for that. We plan to work on the freeways and we're expanding the lanes on that 15 going up as well. We're working on, on uh, off ramps and on ramps to make them flow a little better. Um, but what really the best thing we could do is try to get the jobs where people live. And we focus that very hard as policymakers to try to invite businesses to be where we are building residents. The state's also looking at uh, a new tax called the vehicle uh, miles tax or vehicles travel tax. I forgot what the VMF, um, yeah, vehicles miles tax. There we go. And because we are basically people like me who have electric vehicles aren't paying the gas tax. And I get it. We got to figure out how to have everyone equally pay into the transportation system. But you can see how us in the empire may be more burden than other areas within the urban areas. Because a lot of my residents still travel every day to go from San Bernardino to LA or San Bernardino to Orange County to go to work. They're going to travel a lot more. Most of those wage earners are probably moved out to the really outskirts of uh, our urban area because it's more affordable housing. So they're probably not as high as income earners. So we're going to be putting more of a burden on the lower income earners if we go to that kind of tax as well. So these are all different policies that we're all looking at right now. Um, so as we look at the transition and you sit on all these different boards, um, you know, is there any cohesive sort of planning mechanism to really think about how we transition particularly the medium and heavy duty market to zero emissions. 
I mean, how, how, what, what, what's happening at the local level that you might be able to share with us on, on the planning of, of getting well, heavy duty? I think um, we're, we'll continue to invest in newer technologies and pilot programs. That's what AQMD does a lot. They sponsor the private sector to try a new vehicles. And the, the logic is behind when you start off a new technology, you pay a premium for that technology. If um, I remember back in my assembly days when the first Tesla concept car came out, it didn't look the way it did right now, but it was very expensive. You remember the Model S was like 120,000. Now they got them down to 35,000, you know, five to seven years later. So in volume, things come down. In usage, that technology re gets refined and I guess, um, proven for the lack of a better word. So I think that's what we continue to do as, a, as public entities is we help invest in the future uh, technology to offset that private sector cost when we can. Now we don't have unlimited funds, so it can't be done on a big scale, but at least that technology gets proven, it gets worked out. And then as it goes to mainstream market, hopefully those prices are low enough where the industry can absorb some of those new costs. And again, it's all about how fast you press that accelerator. Do you do it? within you know months or years or decades um based on you know the absorption of it the sustaining that we have to change it every two years 12 to 15 years normally but with all the regulation changing we're changing them out like every four or so um because we went from diesel to let or natural gas to electric and now we're going to try some hydrogen ones so that would be very costly to an organization either private or public unless we're able to offset it with public funds but again, who pays for those public funds? How many layers of taxes and regulation fees can we add to our businesses or residents before they say, hey, we just can't compete here in Southern California anymore? And we see that from, we saw that in the back from our engineering, our aerospace and engineering stuff. We see major companies leave to other states over the, the decades um, because they need to stay competitive, not just nationally, but internationally with other businesses they compete with. Um, so it's really, I think the biggest part for us as policymakers is how fast we put on the accelerator of changing out to sustainable type of um, equipment going forward. Um, you mentioned that you had someone locally that was struggling to get kind of the power and infrastructure for their development. And then even the, the Barstow development might be having some similar problems. Can you share a little bit about what the county or the state's doing to expand the electric grid to meet some of these mandates? Um, it's really, as we know, we, we live kind of in monopolies for energy. Edison owns my area, uh, other place, pg and down south, um, and they're a public company at the same time regulated by CPUC. So really, we don't have a lot of say in that. CPUC says how much they could charge us, which I would say we're already paying more than most other places, but they need that money to make the infrastructure to expand the fastest we're going. So we're the pilot. It's funny, when I went to that conference about the new vehicles uh, technology out there, they're all international manufacturers around the world. They're, you know, given their their um, new truck or whatever the case may be. And they said California is the number one market for this. We're the ones set the standard worldwide right now. We have the most electric vehicles anywhere in the world. And so that burden on Southern California is mostly placed on our electric company because now they have that demand to build that infrastructure. Um, so as our po public policy regulations have pushed that. I guess, vision down to local level, the practical side of it is we're not really there. And to tear up roads and build an infrastructure and a network that was not planned for this kind of quick evolution, and this much demand from our every resident, now you put a car charger in, you know, all these different uh, parts is really put a tax on, on our electric companies. So they're gonna be petitioning the CPUC to charge us all quite a bit more, so they can accelerate that infrastructure, but they don't have the resources to accelerate their infrastructure unless CPUC allows them to do it. And then you have the public tell them we already pay higher than the amounts. So again, it's how fast can you do this at what cost are we gonna do it at? And so all of us will be paying more in our energy bills, quite a bit more in order to get the infrastructure we need to have the sustainability. So it's not just the poll question of what do you want to do for public policy is the cost to those public policies that we also have to consider all the time. And what does that do to our businesses and residents? I know my electric bill is outrageous. <laughs> Let's go ahead. I don't pay gas anymore. So which is this? So you were discussing about the uh, energy issues, getting electricity out there and how the uh, local energy companies have to uh, basically build out their infrastructure more. Uh, are there any local plans to kind of supplement more for solar 
because I know they just raised the, or they lowered the price they pay per watt for home users of solar. And that seems like a good way to take some of the load off of the uh, off Yeah, the I would, companies. you know, again, they're a public, it's not a private company. I mean, it's a private company that is regulated by a public entity. So their responsibility is their stockholders to make a profit too. So when they, from their side of view, they want to limit private production because then they're going to have, you know, less return on their stockholders. From our point of view, we're trying to push it. And another thing we deal with as county supervisors all the time is we do have 22,000 square miles, 20 of it's in the high desert. That's open space. But the biggest landlord there is our federal government who owns most of the land. So there's only, you know, the corridors to put solar fields. And most of the solar fields are going to feed Los Angeles and Orange County users, not Inland Empire users. So one of the things I've been pushing is try to get a break for our residents who have to deal with the infrastructure of building those solar fields. And each, but there are private companies who build those and they have their contracts with Edison or DPW LA or whatever to provide that power. But we are looking to what CACs can be um, and other things. What can we do for our local businesses, the residents to try to keep that cost down? Yeah, you, you're laying out a, a governance problem with uh, <laughs> with the situation. Is there any appetite or any ability to create a public authority that would deal with this at the county level? And which aspect? Yeah, just the infrastructure is actually. Well, we do have every every one of these is a public authority. So SPCTA is focused on building infrastructure for moving people in in trucks on the freeways and roads and side streets. And we do have a local our local cog that's dealing with the. I guess, smart city aspects of it, of uh, working on synchronization of streetlights and stuff, we could move people back quicker. That's that. The county is responsible for land use in the unincorporated areas. You got to remember that because I always get a lot of my residents saying, why you let those um, warehouses go in Fontana or Bloomington? You know, Bloomington's unincorporated, but Fontana, the cities have their own land use yeah. issues. Um, and then SCAG is responsible for the region of five, six counties to 300 some odd cities to try to coordinate a lot of these burdens across the board. So we do have the governance there and we do talk a lot. I mean, obviously the reason why I'm on so many boards is because that's how the board members are selected from the, from the local ones to go on the regional ones. And so we do try to keep that perspective going from one entity to the other, even though sometimes we have to vote one way on one board because we're wearing that hat and we get to another board, we have to vote the opposite way because we're watching that entity. I don't think governance is probably the issue of, of it's more of the practicality of the policies that are given us to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy as a state or a federal politician say, I want clean air for everybody. And that's a great goal. Um, do they think about that when they pass that and then push those burdens on to the local entities to, to make that happen without all the tools to do it? We can have electric vehicles overnight, but we're going to need lots of money to put the infrastructure to support those electric vehicles. And where is that money going to come from? And that's more the, the making of the sausage is more the, the fun stuff we have to deal with more than the actual idealistic goals that are set. Mm -hmm. And the goals are easier to set than actually making those goals happen. And I think that's what we have to deal with on the local governments is, okay, hey, Go Governor Newsom says all electric vehicles by 2035. Okay, now how do we plan as policymakers to put um, enough electric charging stations with enough, um, I'll, I'll, I'll rag on AQMD for a little bit. I go take my electric vehicle in there and we got lots of chargers, but they're seven and a half um, amps or something like that. I'll go there for two or three hours meeting to get 14 miles on my car charge. It's it's not really worth it. I go home, I got a 50 amp, which goes a lot quicker. So it's not just having the things there, but also having the throughput for the energy to charge them up. And is electric going to be our ultimate goal or is it going to be hydrogen or whatever the new technology going to be? And how much do we put into public tax dollars into that infrastructure now if it's changing? And or do we do it all? Um, we talked to local, a lot of my local cities that would love to change from gasoline city vehicles into electric or hydrogen. But the cost on that entity to build the infrastructure to support 40, 50 vehicles, or in the county's case, you know, a thousand vehicles, and again, a county the size of a state is immense. Do we invest that money into it now? Do we do it regionally for multiple cities, which means they have to go drive someplace else to get their fuel or to get charged up? Um, those are our things we're currently doing. But we have all the boards, it's just, we, we, I guess we would say we don't have enough resources to do it all. 
And I would probably argue that if we had all the resources and someone's going to be paying for it, and um, it's probably going to be a big burden on somebody to do that. Didn't uh, San Bernardino County get an award for this year? Yeah, we're number one fleet in the United States. We're actually the most innovative county two years in a row. And so I will brag a little bit about San Bernardino County as I think last year was 82 um, NACO awards, which was now Social Association of Counties for Innovation. And this year we walked away with 160. And last year, I don't know what the other counties got, but um, Riverside got like four. And so it's a big difference. You know, we like to brag about, we're trying to be very innovative in San Bernardino County. Our departments do very well. Number one fleet, number one, a bunch of things. Thank you. All right. With that, I'd like to thank Supervisor Hagman thank for, for coming. Thank you for your, your wisdom and your ideas. It's great to see you. Okay. That was great. Um, I hope all my students, we have a whole group of students here in the LTC right now. I hope they all heard that and uh, took copious notes because it's going to help us on a lot of the research projects that we're working on the supervisor's comments. With that, I'd like to move to our second poll question before we invite, a, invite up our next speaker, Henry McKay from Caltrans to share some of the data and some of the work that they've been doing. Do you believe that the Inland Empire and Inland Port region, so there's two different pieces we wanna talk about when we think about an Inland Port. One, um, as Bob noted, you know, thinking conceptually as an Inland Port, an area that has a lot of characteristics of a port, but we're inland, we're not a seaport, um, but we do have airports that have some of the largest, the largest cargo capacities going on, um, but also that multimodal center that, that um, Supervisor Hagman spoke on, on an actual physical inland port, but we're thinking about more the conceptualized inland port should prioritize social equity as part of the sustainability planning for transportation operations. Huh. Another sort of just lofty little ball out there. Um, yes, both social equity and sustainability should be prioritized. No, focus mainly on sustainability. Unsure. It's a trick question. Yes, very good. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, just kind of, again, thinking about these initial pieces. And now we're going to invite up our next speaker, Henry McKay um, from... Caltrans in Sacramento. So thanks, Kimberly. Um, so it's great to be here, everyone. Uh, my name is Henry McKay. I'm a sustainable transportation analyst um, at Caltrans up in Sacramento. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about a tool that our office is developing called the Caltrans uh, Equity Index. Um, and so basically, the purpose of this tool is to um, do some analysis at kind of a high level. Um, and identify sort of the most burdened uh, communities in the state um, in terms of transportation issues and transportation equity. Um, so I'm going to talk about that today a little bit and kind of how we conceptualized it and developed it, um, what the policy implications are, um, and then show some of the actual data outputs um, specifically, you know, in the Inland Empire area. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so like I said, I'm going to go over kind of the impetus for the tool. Um, you know, kind of the early discussions of how we're planning on using it at the state, um, and then give it, you know, overview of the tool itself, the methodology, um, and some maps, um, and then kind of talk about where we're at in the process and some of our next steps. Next slide. So this, um, this project really started out a few, year, few years ago with the Caltrans equity statement. Um, and the equity index is kind of a direct response to that. Um, and really what we wanted to do is operationalize the Caltrans equity statement um, and you know, develop a data-driven definition of you know, transportation-based priority populations. Um, so we have a lot of definitions of priority populations you know, in different state agencies and different you know, government entities, um, but we wanted to develop a specific one that focuses on transportation issues, um, specifically about you know, Make, making transportation easier for people and, you know, removing barriers to transportation, um, especially for active modes, um, and then um, also reducing the burdens that are caused by transportation, um, which that might be sort of a more pertinent topic to this um, discussion today. Next slide, please. So going into this project, um, there were sort of a few key objectives. Um, you know, we wanted to, you know, develop data indicators to account for equity-based outcomes in transportation, um, you know, develop that 
data-driven definition for underserved communities or priority populations, um, and then actually build something that's useful in evaluating the department's plans and programs and projects and whatnot. Um, so work develop something that we can actually measure outcomes with. Um, that's kind of central to this. Next slide. So I'll go over a little bit about what some of the potential uses are we've been thinking of. Um, a big part of this has been focusing on just what the actual definitions are and what the tool is um, sort of prior to really ironing out these use cases. Um, we, we want the definitions and the data to lead the use cases, not the other way around. Uh, we don't want to be developing a definition that, you know, to make certain projects or things look good or bad. Um, we want to kind of be ob as objective about that as possible um, and then figure out how to apply it to the actual um, programs. Um, but right now we're kind of already using it for a lot of things. Um, you know, a lot of informational use cases like project reviews and certain environmental things. Um, kind of the first big purpose of this was for funding allocation, potentially another sort of project prioritization. So if we're looking at trying to figure out what projects are going to do the best on equity issues, um, this tool is kind of set up to do that. And then just general decision making around, you know, planning, project prioritization, you know, equity assessment, um, and other, other things like that. Next slide, please. So the approach we took when developing this um, was pretty specific and I would say different than a lot of other equity screening tools. Um, in California, the one that is most common is CalEnviroScreen and folks are probably familiar with that. Um, this is different in sort of a few key ways. So um, first we wanted to build something that was more granular. Um, you know, if you use census data, oftentimes you're limited to the census tract level, but you know, in a lot of rural areas and Basically, if you're not in a you know high dense urban area, census tracts tend to be kind of too large to do granular analysis. Um, and so, specifically with the transportation indicators we're looking at, with you know traffic impacts and you know access to destinations and things, those are really granular in nature. And so, uh, we wanted to be granular and use census blocks. We also only included spatially significant indicators um, that have a direct focus on sort of transportation decision making. Um, you know, when we were starting this project out, we got a lot of requests to include a lot of different data layers, but, you know, including everything doesn't necessarily make it a useful tool. Um, we wanted to be really focused on, you know, what, what, what are, what are data sets that we can actually analyze spatially that are a spatial, you know, that are spatial in nature, like, you know, traffic, um, and then demographics like race and ethnicity and income as well tend to be sort of, um, uh, spatial and how they're laid out. Um, and then we also wanted to focus just on, you know, decisions that we can impact with the department. So there's lots of equity issues that sort of fall outside of the purview of what we can do. Of course, there's cumulative impacts that we want to worry about as well that maybe tools like Calum Bioscreen are better suited to deal with, but um, we wanted to have a narrow focus. And then lastly, we tried to make it as simple as possible and avoid, you know, double counting. So you can... You could look at like traffic as a as the externality, for example, um, and there's a lot of different externalities there: noise, all the different pollutants, greenhouse gas emissions, um, you know, crashes to some extent. Um, and so we wanted to, where possible, kind of combine those into single indicators. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, um, we arrived at a pretty simple set of indicators that we're including in the tool at this point for version one. Um, on the transportation burden side, uh, we're looking at truck weighted traffic proximity and volume. Um, so that's basically a measurement of how much traffic uh, a census block is exposed to. Um, this is a really short presentation, so I'm not gonna get super into the weeds on how we calculated this, but we do have documentation up on our site um, and links to the GitHub and, um, would be happy to address you know, questions later over email as well. Um, for the burdens, we're also looking at crash exposure, which is basically, um, you could think of it as like a high, net, high injury network type analysis that's commonly applied to street networks, um, but applied to census blocks statewide. So it's looking at, relatively speaking, where are the areas with you know, high crash concentrations. Um, for transportation benefits, um, we're using an indicator called access to destinations. Um, and this is in some ways kind of a proxy for cost of transportation, but it's really looking at, um, you know, how much stuff you can get to um, and how easy it is to get to that stuff on the transportation network, uh, meaning that, you know, longer trips are weighted less than, than shorter trips. Um, specifically, at this point, we're looking at non-auto access. Um, basically, the reason for that is that, you know, if you live in the state, 
um, auto access, generally speaking, is, is pretty high. Um, and we're not in a place of building a lot of new highways. And so if, if you can't get to a lot of things with your car, um, oftentimes that's more of a land use issue than a transportation one. Um, but there are a lot of really significant barriers to non-auto accessibility, you know, transit, bike, and pedestrian. Um, and so we, we look at those modes and we compare them to auto to kind of get a relative measurement of, um, you know, how good is your non-auto access? Um, relatively speaking, statewide. And we look at that for work destinations as well as non-work destinations. And then lastly, we pair that with demographic data, um, household income, as well as race and ethnicity um, to kind of determine where are these areas that are the most burdened, um, have the least amount of benefits, that, again, we're measuring accessibility, um, that are also you know, lower income or mostly non-white. Next slide, please. So I'll show just kind of, uh, illustrative heat maps of what these indicators look like um, in the Inland Empire region. Um, on the left, you can see the traffic proximity and volume indicator. Again, that's just kind of how much traffic um, an area is exposed to. Um, you can see it really lighting up around the 40 and the 10 corridors in the more rural areas. Um, and in your kind of more dense urban areas, a lot of times you'll get um, cumulative impacts from highways and you know local arterials that have a lot of traffic volume as well. Um, so, of course, you're seeing those areas light up, too. Um, on the right is crash exposure. Uh, this is a more, you know, localized um, metric for sure. Um, but you can see there is some overlap with the traffic proximity volume, because um, lots of traffic volumes do tend to drive um, crashes in a lot of cases. Um, but there are different areas as well. And so there, you know, you could be screening an area that's, you know, might have less traffic, but kind of is disproportionately unsafe and is getting um, a lot of crash burden. Next slide, please. Um, so here's our access to destinations um, metrics shown on this map. Um, the, the darker part of the map is showing where that, ra where that ratio between non-auto access and auto access is, is highest. Um, and so basically where relative multimodal access is, is stronger. Um, I will note that, you know, in, in the area that's the darkest kind of, you know, around San Bernardino, um, that's only about 5%. So that, what, that, what that means is that you can get to about 5% of the things you get to driving, um, taking the bus and walking. Um, in other parts of the state, like you know maybe downtown San Francisco, um, up in Northern California or downtown Los Angeles, um, that number is about 30%-ish, um, but it's, it's pretty low statewide. Next slide, please. And then here you can see the demographic data that we're kind of pairing with these other transportation indicators. Um, again, looking at median household income and um, percentage non-white. Um, both of these range pretty broadly across the statewide spectrum um, from, you know, very, very low income and uh, mostly, you know, almost 100% non-white um, up to, you know, income well over $200,000 um, average in the block group um, and, and not very non-white. Um, so, yeah, we, we combine these we use um, thresholds um, with these with these indicators to develop um, screens, which I'll talk about next. Uh, next slide, please. So, so this graphic shows kind of what the actual concept of the EQI tool is. Um, all the things I just showed were just the data indicators that go into that. Um, I will note that we're making the data available um, just kind of as is. So. You know, if if you want to do like a statewide, you know, analysis on where is multimodal accessibility good, um, you can certainly use this tool for those type of other analyses as well. Um, but ultimately, the purpose of the tool is to screen for issues, um, and so we kind of needed to develop um, thresholds and, and screens for that. And so we have three screens in the tool: the traffic exposure screen, um, which is looking at areas in the state that are you know lower income and mostly non-white um, that are the most burdened by traffic. And by that we mean you know have the most exposure to traffic and all the negative externalities of it, and or um, are in areas with the highest amount of crash exposure. Next we have the access to destination screen, um, which again is looking at lower income and mostly non-white areas um, that just have poor access to destinations um, by non-auto modes. And so what that means is you're basically reliant on a car to get everywhere, um, which in some cases might be okay, but you know is more expensive. And if you have a physical disability or you're at an age where you can't drive or you're you know young, you don't have a license, um, that's that's a real problem. And so since we're looking at equity issues, um, that's kind of key here. 
Um, and then lastly, we have the priority population screen, um, which is kind of the primary screen we use because um, it includes all these things. Um, that's looking at lower income and mostly non-white parts of the state um, that, are the, that are the most burdened by traffic, um, but also you know are getting the least amount of benefits from a good multimodal transportation system. And so they're kind of the biggest focus areas in terms of transportation equity um, as, as we're defining it, which again is kind of a narrow specific definition. Um, and it's not to say there aren't a lot of other transportation equity issues um, that just aren't in this tool that you know we can deal with in different ways and analyze analyze in different ways. Next slide, please. So I'll show three maps just showing these screens. Again, the, the previous, the indicators themselves are continuous variables. Um, the, the screens are binary, just yes or no. Does, does this area meet these criteria? Um, and so for the traffic exposure screen, um, you can see where those areas are lighting up or being screened, which is fairly unsurprising. Um, in the Inland Empire, so San Bernardino and Riverside counties, um, it covers about 17 or 18 percent of the, the population. Uh, next slide. So on the other hand, you know the the traffic exposure you know covers a fair, fairly narrow part of the state's population, mostly people living just around highways and busy streets as well. Um, on the access to destination side, it's kind of the opposite. Um, the way we've you know, put the screen together, it covers a lot of the state's population. Um, and specifically in the Il Inland Empire, it covers about 80.6, so just a majority. Um, and the areas that are being not screened here are probably still have relatively poor access, um, but are um, are just, you know, higher income. And so for context, though, like there's other parts of the state, like, you know, a lot of the Bay Area is excluded from the screen just because it does have relatively good access. Um, so, you know, the, the counties here just have, generally speaking, because of the sprawling land uses, um, it, they're going to score lower. Um, that being said, this tool is calibrated for statewide use. Um, so if, if something like this was to be applied, you know, on a local level to make decisions, you might recalibrate those thresholds um, to the local context more. Because, um, again, they are kind of, you know, currently set in a way that accounts for, like, San Francisco, you know, Truckee. Uh, San Bernardino, like kind of everywhere in the state. And so um, it's a little less sensitive than it could be if we applied it locally. Um, next slide. And then lastly, with the priority population screen, um, this is the least amount of population coverage, about 17 or 18 percent. So same as traffic exposure. Um, and it's looking at those areas with, um, you know, high traffic burdens and poor multimodal access that are also low income and are non-white. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll end. So I'm going to just chat real quick about a comparison to some other equity tools that folks here may be familiar with, um, and then talk about kind of our next steps. Um, so we we do a lot of comparisons to other you know screening tools out there, like Calenviro Screen is the really common one, um, but the federal government's increasingly um, developing equity related screening tools as well. And so what we do this with this analysis is mostly just wanting to show kind of what the key differences are how the outputs are different and what's driving those differences. And they're, they're different tools at the end of the day. So it's not really a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, and you really don't want to say that one's doing something better or worse. Um, they're just different. Um, but specifically compared to, you know, Cal Enviro screen and um, the climate and economic justice screening tool, which is a tool developed by the federal government for the Justice 40 program, um, I've compared those here to um, the EQI priority population screen, looking at the metric of how much of the population is covered with the screen, because um, that's kind of what a lot of people care about and an important you know, thing to know. Um, and so you can see I've, you know, kind of varies throughout the state. In some places, some of the tools cover like most of the population, EQI covers none. Um, again, they're looking at different indicators, um, but I did um, draw red, you know, squares around and try to highlight um, San Bernardino and Riverside County specifically, um, where you can see that in San Bernardino, EQI and um, uh, Calum virus screen actually are pretty similar um, in what they cover. Uh, the Justice 40 tool covers a lot more, but it just it has more indicators. Um, and in River, or sorry, no, that was Riverside. In San Bernardino, um, EQI covers a little bit less than the other tools, but it's still, you know, somewhat comparable. 
Um, generally speaking, EQI is a more is a more granular tool, and so it's going to cover less of a given population, um, and that's in a lot of ways because we use census blocks. And so, if you have a census tract and it meets the sc um, screening criteria, um, it's going to be including a lot of population that might not meet that criteria as well, just because census tracts are big. And so, with blocks, we're able to kind of more granularly um, assess impacts. Next slide. And then lastly, I'll just discuss sort of where we're at in the you know engagement stage and what some of our next steps are. Um, we've been conducting outreach for the past um, six months or so. Um, and our formal comment period is wrapping up pretty soon at the end of the month. Um, uh, so we're, we're hoping to release you know version one of this tool um, pretty soon within hopefully the next month or so this summer. Um, at this point we have a you know draft sort of beta version out on the website um, and documentation. Um, which we don't expect to change all that much, but we do have a few little technical refinements that we'll be releasing for version one, um, along with you know a lot of documentation and stuff like that. Um, once we release that midsummer, we're going to turn our attention to sort of developing those use cases. Um, we've already started that work. Um, we've been working with a lot of different Caltrans programs on figuring out how to incorporate this tool into their work, into their equity processes. Um, but so we're going to continue refining those and really ramp that work up and try to do more. Um, and then, you know, in fall, starting around October, um, we're really going to turn our attention to presenting those use cases and holding another series of workshops, um, which we've already done a lot of workshops, but they've been focused to get sort of on what I presented today, like what the tool is. Um, and so we'll be turning to talking about um, how we're going to actually be using it um, and then doing public review in November, December. Uh, next slide. So that's that's the EQI. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me at my email here. Um, we give a few links um, for you know our web map, our website, and we have an email inbox that you can reach out to as well. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to present, um, and I hope some of it was was relevant. Um, probably some of it was less so than others, but. Um, Specifically on the traffic exposure side, that's definitely an important consideration of, um, and it's been brought up before of like the different types of sustainability and, you know, that tool is really looking at, you know, um, the the environmental sustainability component, um, looking at where those burdens are. But of course, um, reducing those burdens can can happen in different ways, and you have to look at the trade offs of that as well. Thank you so much, Henry, for that. Um, I am gonna. Um... If there's a one burning question, we might be able to take one burning yeah. question. Otherwise, we're going to move on to our next speaker, and then we can have any questions at the end, if that's all right. Um, so we just have one question from uh, our one of our next speakers. Can you, can you read the full question? The ability of this tool to screen at the census block level is very useful. Could you please comment on the sources of underlining data for traffic and crash exposure? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so traffic is HPMS data or Highway Performance Monitoring System data. So it's just center line data for the national highway system uh, with, with AADT volume. Um, so that's that's great. And we can just make that as granular as we want. Um, we have a Python script that um, basically does those calculations and applies it to like spatial um, sort of areas. So you could do it for census tracks, census blocks, you know, 100 meter grid cells, kind of whatever you want. Um, and that was a big part of this is developing indicators that we're not limited to, you know, one specific unit for that we can kind of customize and tailor. Um, so that, that's on the traffic side. We also we do some waiting around truck um, emissions that, that that data comes from car, but it's not as spatial. Um, and then on the crash exposure side, we're using um, Tim's data from UC Berkeley, but it's really just derived from um, Switter's highway patrol data, which is basically just crash records. Um, an important thing too is we're doing on and off system. So, you know, of course, we're the Department of Transportation and um, are the stewards of the, the highway, the state highway system. Um, this tool does include data from off system facilities as well. So it's kind of looking at the whole network a little bit more holistically. Thank you so much for that, Henry. Um, so I'm going to have us move on just so that we can, you know, keep ourselves going forward. Um, I'll bring up our next speakers after our next poll question. Our next question is, um, where do you think the largest concentration of medium and heavy duty vehicles are in the Inland Empire? 
And Ontario and neighboring cities, San Bernardino neighboring cities, Riverside neighboring cities, Temecula and neighboring cities, the high desert communities or Coachella Valley. And our next presentation is gonna show a bit about that. So thinking about the medium and a heavy duty fleets, here we go. So Ontario and San Bernardino, oh, hold on, San Bernardino, another person put in there. So Ontario and San Bernardino are the two top pieces. And our next speakers, um, two students from Cal State San Bernardino are gonna present some of the work that we're doing at the Leonard Transportation Center. So I'd like to bring up Bavik Katri and Sai. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sai Kalyanayagari. I'm a master's in computer science at Cal State San Bernardino. And uh, my name is Bavik Khatri and I'm a computer science uh, student at Cal State as well. Uh, we both work as the research assistants at LTC and today we are going to present the traffic analysis of medium and heavy duty trucks in the Inland Empire region. The next slide. Yeah, so this is the agenda for today. We'll be giving you a brief introduction of our study. Then we'll be uh, concentrating on the area of our research, then the data sources we have, the results and the future work of our study. Um, so the introduction. Uh, so the Inland Empire is, is, is pretty huge. It has 4 million in population and spread across 27,000 square miles. And so the logistic industry has a very heavy impact in the region. And so uh, the, the, the number of medium and heavy duty trucks uh, are pretty huge over here. But these trucks uh, could cause sustainability issues. So hence, uh, we need to look forward to electrification of these medium and heavy duty trucks uh, in the region. And uh, therefore we are exploring uh, opportunity charging as a uh, solution to kind of uh, build a sustainable region. Uh, so the next slide. So before we, we uh, move on, we need to kind of get to know a few definitions that you will come across throughout the presentation. Um, so uh, subregions is a term that we are using. Uh, it's it's a six uh, main city cluster. So it, these are six subregions that we'll have, and those are based off the main cities. Uh, so to say, in each region, uh, buffer is a a, a radius. Uh, that is around the six regions and it's approximately 130 miles. Uh, medium duty is a class of uh, class four to class six vehicles and heavy duty is a class seven to class 13 uh, vehicles. Then we have uh, regional short haulers, which are the trips that we uh, denote as the trips which are within 130 miles and the trips that go beyond the 130 mile buffer region is uh, the long hauler trips. So uh, the next slide, please. Uh, now let us look at the area of the study. The next slide. Uh, so this is the Inland Empire region, which constitutes of the San Bernardino and the Riverside counties. The next slide. Uh, so this is the area of study where we have the six subregions and the adjacent counties. So this is the buffer zone we have, which is the convergence of the six regions. So we have the north, the east, the south subregion, the north center, the south center, and the west. And as you can see, the whole uh, border of the county is a buffer zone. So anything outside this border is a long hauler trip, and anything within this is a short hauler trip. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, so as you can see in the slide, these are the cities which are in the subregions. So for the east region, we have the Coachella Valley. For the north, we have the high desert area. For the north center, we have San Bernardino and the nearby cities. Temecula area uh, comes under the south region. The uh, Riverside and the adjacent areas are included in the uh, south center region. And uh, Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga and uh, nearby cities come under the west region. Moving on to the next slide. So the data source, the primary source of data for our uh, research is streetlights. So they provide the traffic data for conducting the analysis based on which we have different uh, traffic patterns and the traffic volumes. So this is the user interface of the streetlight where we uh, input the zones of our uh, regions and then we get the data accordingly. Next slide. Uh, the sample size. So the sample size is nothing but the approximate trip count of the trucks. 
So for the medium duty trucks, we have a uh, 2.2 million and for the heavy duty trucks, 1.8 million is the sample size of the trucks uh, for which we conducted the study of the analysis. Next slide. Uh, so now we'll be looking at uh, the uh, results which we have obtained from the data which we have. So there are mainly two types of uh, results which we have. One is based on the volume and another is the origin and destination pairs. So the first one depicts as the traffic count. So this traffic count is the pass through. So any truck which passes through of all the six regions in our study is considered in this uh, category. So first we have the medium duty trucks. So in medium duty trucks, as mentioned, it is a class four to class six trucks. So in the medium duty, we have the south center that is the uh, Riverside and the nearby area. So this has the highest concentration of medium duty trucks with an approximate volume of 12,000. And then uh, for the heavy duty trucks, we have uh, the West region, which is the Rancho Cucamonga and the Ontario regions. So this has the highest one. So the least for the medium duty is the East region, which is the Coachella Valley. And the least for the heavy duty is the South region, which is the Temecula area. The next slide. So the, this one is uh, after this, we will be seeing the traffic volume on the basis of the uh, R segments. So this is the source of EV charging cost based on the time of use periods. So we have four different time slots from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m., 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. and 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. So these are the different EV charging costs. So based on this, we conducted a different analysis for the concentration of the medium and the heavy duty trucks. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so for the medium and the heavy duty trucks, next please. Yeah. For the medium and the heavy duty trucks, the highest concentration is for the South center region, which is again, the Riverside and the, the neighboring areas. We can see that the most of the traffic concentration is from 6 AM to 4 PM. Uh, moving on to the heavy duty trucks. Uh, as we can see, the south uh, center for the medium duty is the highest, followed by the north center and the west region. Again, the Coachella Valley area, that is the east region, has the least volume. Moving on to the heavy duty, the, uh, we can see that there is a switch in the trend of the traffic volumes, where we have the west region, that is the uh, Ontario and the Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, followed by the south center and the least volume is for the south region that is the Temecula area which has a traffic uh, volume of approximately 3000 trucks. The next slide. Uh, so this is the next uh, analysis which we did on the basis of the day segments. So Monday to Friday are classified as the weekday and uh, Saturday and Sunday come under the weekend. So for the weekday medium duty, the south center has the highest uh, uh, traffic count. So the south center is the Riverside and the nearby counties. And as we can see, the east region has uh, the lowest uh, concentration. The same trend follows for the medium duty as well on a weekend. Uh, moving on to the heavy duty vehicles, the we can see there is again a slight change in the trend. The west region has the highest volume, uh, followed by the south region, which has the least volume. The same pattern is again continued for the heavy duty vehicles on a weekend. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now we'll talk about the origin destination uh, trips. Um, so, um, as, uh, Sai told, there are like two kind of, uh, pieces of the data that we have. One is volume and one is, uh, the OD trips. So, uh, OD trips, uh, as we can see, we have, uh, two sections away as well, the medium duty and the heavy duty for medium duty. Um, uh, again, uh, North center region, which is, uh, the San Bernardino area kind of has, uh, the highest, uh, OD trips or the, uh, OD traffic, uh, compared to all the other regions. And uh, the lowest one is the North region, which is again, uh, the high desert area. For heavy duty, uh, next please. Yeah, so as we can see for heavy duty, it's it's again North Center, which is the San Bernardino uh, region. And it is approximately, it's, it's way more, it's more than like 10 million uh, OD trips. And uh, the least one is the east, which is the Coachella Valley area. It's it's less than a million. So, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, by the way, the the previous slide was uh, from uh, within the region. So now we'll talk from regions to regions. So if uh, consider me going from the Coachella Valley uh, region to the San Bernardino area. So these are the trips that define those. 
Uh, over here, we could see uh, the South Center region has the highest uh, traffic uh, volume and uh, uh, sorry, the OD trips and um, South Center being the Riverside area and the least is the East, which is again, the Coachella Valley area. And uh, next one, please. Yeah, so again, over here, San Bernardino is, is uh, pretty high when compared to uh, other regions, uh, which is around 9 million, yeah. So these were the regions to regions. And now we'll talk about the counties to regions. So next slide, please. So these graphs represent the uh, OD trips that come from the counties to the six regions that we have defined. And uh, for medium duty, uh, as we could see, we have uh, West, which is uh, the Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga, and these regions, which have 3 million uh, uh, OD pairs. Uh, and the least is the East one, which is uh, the Coachella Valley area. For heavy duty, uh, as we can see, again, San Bernardino uh, area has the uh, highest uh, truck traffic and the east region, uh, sorry, the south one, which is uh, the Temecula region has the least. Uh, so coming to the next slide. Uh, now we'll be looking at the different trip metrics for the analysis which we did. So this is based on the average travel time for the medium duty trucks. Uh, so for the medium duty trucks, for, for the internal regions, that is the San Bernardino to San Bernardino within the same region, the travel time, the average travel time is approximately equal to 20 minutes. Then moving on, if uh, the truck is moving from Riverside to one of the regions we have, the travel time is approximately 80 minutes. And if it is traveling from a county such as Los Angeles or uh, the Imperial County to one of our six regions defined, it is approximately 120. The same trend follows for the heavy duty vehicles as well the next image please uh, the same trend as we can see is followed for the heavy duty vehicles we'll be looking on to the next metrics that is the average travel distance uh, the next slide yeah uh, so for the medium and the heavy duty trucks the same uh, pattern which we saw for the time follows for the distance as well the region to the region distance is low and for the San Bernardino to Riverside, the, the travel distance is approximately for 60 miles. And then uh, for the, the counties to the regions, we have the uh, distance as 120 miles for the average for the medium trucks. The same pattern follows for the heavy duty vehicles as well. Uh, so now these are the observations that uh, kind of uh, going back to the previous uh, plots and graphs that you saw. So um, the first one over here is again, uh, in the traffic volume for heavy duty vehicles is substantially higher uh, when compared to the medium uh, duty vehicles uh, in the six regions, six sub regions, sorry, uh, approximately 2.25 times. Uh, most of the traffic is between 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, approximately 60% of the average daily traffic uh, for the sub regions that we have. San Bernardino uh, and the area which is uh, surrounding it uh, receives the highest percentage uh, for heavy duty uh, traffic uh, from the inland empires uh, and the other regions as well. Uh, medium duty truck has the highest trips within the sub regions itself. So again, within the sub regions is a trip which starts from San Bernardino and ends in the San Bernardino region itself. Uh, then truck trips that average uh, 10 to 50 miles per trip favor dense charging networks and smaller batteries. And uh, while trips that average up to 140 miles uh, uh, require extensive fast charging and a, and a larger battery. Whereas the truck trips averaging from 10 to 50 minutes can benefit from off peak use and frequent charging, whereas the trips uh, averaging up to two hours require efficient charging and uh, inter-regional coordination. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, uh, for the future work, based on the discussions we had, the takeaways, the key takeaways in the discussion will be uh, uh, tying up them with the research we did on the traffic analysis. So we'll be working on the opportunity charging, the policy analysis and the business models. So we'll be dealing with the land use data, the parking and the resting areas of the trucks and where these trucks are concentrated in the regions uh, on the warehouses based on the next code. And then we'll be also dealing with the dwelling data. The next slide. 
Yeah, uh, we would like to thank Dr. Kimberly Collins, Dr. Yunfi Hao, and Dr. Rafi for giving us the opportunity to represent our work. And we would like to thank the entire LTC team and the SB1 CSU Transportation Center for this opportunity. Uh, so the analysis which we did for the volume and the origin destination pair is for 2021 as mentioned in the slides. So the whole of the analysis belongs to 2021 year. All right, thank you, Bob. I can say. Uh, let's go to our, our poll four and then we'll just jump right in. We can have any questions and discussion, of course, after on the data presented. So our next question is, um, do you believe the growth in truck traffic due to an increased number of warehouses threatens the livability of the Inland Empire cities? Oh, another. <laughs> I know. Yes, it, it poses a significant threat, possibly, but there are solutions to mitigate the impact. No, it doesn't pose a major threat, and I'm not certain. And then uh, we will invite up our next speaker who's on, who's online. Okay, yes. And then we have some ways to mitigate. So that's what we're working towards um, in looking at this data and thinking about the future. All right, with that, I'd like to invite our next speaker from UCR, um, Kanuk Bori Boon Somin. Um, thank you so much, Kanuk, for being here and I hope we're okay on time, so. Yes, yeah, thank you, Kimberly, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here uh, with you all this morning. Thank you, uh, LCT, uh, LTC, for inviting me to be part of this dialogue. Uh, it's been very interesting to see the presentations uh, before uh, mine. And uh, my name is Kanok Boribun Somsin. Um, I'm research engineer and associate director of College of Engineering, Center for Environmental Research and Technology at UC Riverside. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the work that we have done uh, in, in recent years related to uh, the region. Next slide, please. And um, yeah, the topic is uh, focused on uh, how we can reduce air pollution impact from goods movement uh, in our region uh, and specifically through uh, truck electrification. So continuing the theme from uh, the previous presentations. Next slide, please. And um, again, uh, as a narrative, um, yeah, we uh, we kind of uh, have heard many times already today that uh, the Inland Empire has become uh, one of the nation's largest logistic hubs. We have over a billion of warehouse space in the region, and it's growing. And one in eight um, workers uh, in our region is also connected one way or another with the logistic industry. So logistic is a very important uh, economic engine for the region, but uh, it also bring a lot of um, impacts that uh, can be uh, both local and regional. Uh, some of these impacts are uh, obviously traffic congestion from a lot of truck traffic, and that may cause traffic safety concern in the neighborhoods. Um, and all these trucks with their heavy weight can also accelerate uh, degradation of road pavements and uh, last but not least, of course, uh, right now, most of the trucks are diesel trucks and they produce quite a bit of emissions and cause air pollution and as well as noise pollution. Next slide, please. Now, those impacts are higher near freight facilities and by freight facilities, uh, these include uh, seaports, airports, rail yards, and even warehouses uh, throughout the region. And uh, this, I, I, I really like this graphic from South Coast AQMD where uh, it showed that on average for the South Coast region, uh, the Cal Emerald sc screen score is average at 61 uh, percentile, 61st percentile. But if we kind of focus in on communities that are within half a mile from a warehouse, the score, the average score for those communities shoot up to 80th percentile. So we can see the uh, disproportionate burden that these communities uh, are having. Next slide, please. And um, yeah, in the previous slide, we, we heard about pass through traffic and, and sub regional traffic and, and uh, that. So pass through traffic is, uh, is kind of uh, significant because we have a lot of truck that goes from the port and uh, try to go to the east to the rest of the nation, right? And, and uh, our region is 
is right there in the middle where a lot of trucks have to go through the freeways. But because our region also have a lot of warehouses that attract these trucks, um, many of these trucks also go into uh, communities, go into cities, pass by residential neighborhood and bring the impact closer to residents uh, in those uh, communities. And one of the most uh, obvious impact is traffic emissions. And for these little trucks, uh, they produce a lot of nitrogen oxide emissions as well as uh, fine particulate matter emissions. And both types of pollutants uh, have been linked to a variety of diseases. And, and for NOx, uh, it also contributes to smog that is uh, very uh, common in our region. Next slide, please. So reducing emissions from these trucks is critical and for many reasons. Uh, first of all, about seven and a half percent of total greenhouse gas emission in the US come from medium and heavy duty trucks. And if we kind of zoom into just the South Coast air basin, 20% uh, of NOx emissions come from this truck. And uh, at a uh, far lesser extent, 8% of total P PM 2.5 emission also come from these trucks. Now, the state has taken actions, right, with the new advanced green trucks, as well as advanced green fleet regulations. 100% um, of new drayage truck sales we have to be zero emission vehicles next year. That's right, next year already is, is coming so fast, this uh, regulation. And by 2035, all drayage trucks operating in California must be zero emission vehicles. Uh, it's an aggressive timeline, uh, but I hope it's the timeline that we, we can achieve. Now, based on the current state of the technologies, most of the early zero emission trucks would likely be uh, battery electric technology, even though uh, hydrogen fuel cell trucks would follow later and, and have important roles to play in the long term. But in the next few years, we would probably see most of them being battery electric. Next slide, please. Now, for drayage trucks, they are subject to the most aggressive timeline in the ACF regulation. And why? It's, it's because drayage is uh, a very ideal uh, application for zero emission vehicles uh, because first of all, they only travel limited daily distance, most of the time less than hundred miles a day. And they also return to home base every night so they can get charged overnight. Um, and they spend a lot of time creeping uh, and idling uh, at the ports or uh, near the warehouse and things like that. And this type of operation doesn't use a lot of energy. Last but not least, uh, many drayage trucks, uh, they tend to operate in uh, environmental justice communities. So uh, by cleaning them up first, uh, it bring benefit to these communities sooner. Next slide, please. Now, there are still many operational barriers to the adoption of battery electric trucks. Um, right now, uh, range is still relatively short compared to uh, conventional diesel trucks. So commercially available model um, now a day uh, can go as far as 250 miles, um, even though um, Tesla is coming out with uh, 500 miles trucks, um, but that's still being uh, demonstrated. Charging time is still too long uh, for a full shot that would take uh, at least an hour and, and usually it's gonna be 90 minutes or longer depending on the charging speed. And for trucking, uh, that's not uh, something that they can afford to do. They cannot have drivers sitting for an hour or longer just to have the truck being charged. Um, and Speaking of charging, uh, charging infrastructure, especially for trucks that require uh, fast charging, those infrastructure is still very limited. Um, and if we're talking about public charging station for trucks, they are almost non-existent now. Next slide, please. 
Um, but the good news is uh, many technological solutions can help. Of, obviously, I already talked about new trucks that can go uh, longer, uh, can have longer range. Um, and then um, even though nowadays uh, the fastest charger is about 350 kilowatt, but uh, there have been uh, research and development efforts to develop charging chargers that can be as high power as one megawatt. Um, and then there are also new innovative charging technologies that can allow these trucks to be charged more often and like in more situation, right? For example, in the photos, that's, that's a, a picture of a truck uh, traveling over a charging track uh, while it's inside a, a port picking up container. And also um, fleet management will become different with uh, these type of uh, new technologies because uh, battery electric trucks have unique operating characteristics. So uh, fleet management tools, we have to adapt to those characteristics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you see, real side, we have been studying uh, some of these innovative charging solutions. And the idea is, can we provide opportunity charging to these trucks where and when they would normally be uh, idling at, right? Such as when they're uh, queuing at terminal gates uh, and uh, loading or unloading cargoes at warehouses. And this has um, many benefits. Uh, one is that will help reduce the deadhead mines for these trucks, right? Instead of having them travel with empty a container trying to go to the charging station and then go to uh, the final destination later. That's kind of uh, additional dead head mines that are not necessary with, with new technologies. Um, and because of that, uh, it can keep these trucks productivity high. Um, we are analyzing um, real world operation data of various trucks in Southern California. Um, and I, I have some uh, result to show in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So on this slide, this uh, graphic, it showed the satellite view of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And um, there are red polygons or red patches uh, throughout the port complex. And these are the area that based on real world data that we have, uh, they are the areas where trucks spend a lot of time in. In fact, yeah, about 40% of their day uh, are spent in one of these, or uh, are spent in these uh, red patches. And if we can tap into the time that the trucks spend in this area by installing something like wireless chargers or setting up ways for this truck to be shot while they are there, that will help increase the range of these trucks because they will have to go to these uh, locations anyway. And from our analysis, um, if we can provide charging opportunity for battery electric trucks when they go to the ports and spend time in these red patches, it will increase their ability to uh, service this existing job by five percentage point, right? So going from 79% to 84%. Uh, and this is again, because of the, uh, the additional charging that they can receive while they are inside the port. Next slide, please. Now that same concept and technology can also apply, can be applied to inland ports. And, and by inland ports here, I mean yeah, uh, any location uh, in our region. And uh, I have one example here where uh, the map on the left show the activity of a truck, uh, a sample truck that mostly serve the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, but occasionally this truck also travel out to uh, our region. So in this particular case, it traveled out to a warehouse in Moreno Valley. Now, because of the distance and the range of the battery electric truck technology nowadays, 
um, it may be challenging for this truck to do that trip, right? To come out to Merino Valley and go back to the home base in LA. However, if we are able to provide operating charging uh, to this truck when it's at the warehouse in Merino Valley, then that become more feasible for battery electric truck to actually uh, do this trip. Next slide, please. And another good news is now there are more incentives for, for that to be the case, right? Because uh, warehouses uh, with space greater than 100,000 square feet are now subject to South Coast AQMD Warehouse Indirect Source Rule or ISR. And ISR is already uh, 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 in place now and, and the warehouses, we have to try to uh, accumulate uh, points in order to offset their emission mitigation fees. And one way is they can uh, earn points is to install uh, charging infrastructure for zero emission vehicles, as well as to use those charging infrastructure. So there are incentive for warehouses throughout the Inland Empire to install uh, charging station or charges for trucks and allow these trucks to receive opportunity charging when they visit those warehouses. Next slide, please. Now, um, having said all these, um, yeah, there are still a lot of research that need to be done. Um, again, these technology are new and we tend to think about, okay, we need uh, electric trucks. We also need chargers. But there are other supporting technologies that uh, can also help to smooth out the transition. Uh, and again, uh, I would like to circle back to fleet management, right? So the way that fleet is going to have to schedule and dispatch electric trucks is going to look quite differently from what they are doing now. And also with the new requirement related to charging these trucks, charging management becomes something uh, very important and it has to be done right in order to make the fleet operation run smoothly. Um, and um, we have heard about charging infrastructure, uh, charging infrastructure deployment over and over, and uh, it's still something that gonna take years. And we need to understand how transportation network and the grid network are right now and how we can integrate them in a way that optimize uh, both networks uh, at the same time. Um, we also need to ensure that uh, future deployment of the battery electric trucks and charging infrastructure is done in an equitable manner. Um, last but not least, um, we also want to quantify all the benefits that are associated with truck electrification, whether it be in terms of climate, uh, air quality, jobs, and others. Next slide, please. Yeah, speaking of research, uh, research uh, at UC Riverside, we recently established a, a collaborative called uh, Create IE, uh, which is short for collaborative research to expand and X-ray transportation electrification in the inland empire. And this collaborative kind of go beyond just trucks and infrastructure is, is uh, take a holistic view of how we can transition the freight, uh, the freight logistic in the region towards a cleaner future, right? We, we still want to focus on technology advancement, but we also look at uh, workforce development and community, community engagement issues as well. Next slide, please. And so far, uh, we have held two workshops uh, to kind of gather stakeholders and kind of get input from all stakeholder groups, from government agencies, communities, industries. And we kind of summarize um, the key action items in order to move transit, uh, the electrification of heavy duty and medium duty trucks in the region forward. So from the technology side, um, again, yeah, the, the industry we we'll need to continue to improve 
the driving range of the truck, the charging speed of the chargers, and also working with uh, Goldman and others uh, trying to increase charging access to uh, not only fleets, but also uh, independent owner operators. Um, we also need to increase grid capacity, uh, reliability and resiliency in order to deal with the increased uh, electrical load that will be required to support all these uh, new electric vehicles. Uh, speaking of charging infrastructure, right now, each installation of charging stations take months, uh, if not years. So we have to accelerate that. We have to shorten the timeline for the deployment of charging infrastructure. In terms of workforce development, um, it's important that in this transition, we have to provide opportunity and access to workers uh, for upskilling and to quality jobs. In fact, uh, it's, it could be a major uh, a critical part because um, I have heard of stories where electric trucks are sitting in the yard waiting for chargers to be installed. However, um, training uh, qualified workers to install those chargers could even take longer. So it's also important that we start to build up training programs uh, to train future workforce in the electrification era now, right, whether it be in university, community colleges, and or even high school. Um, the last component is community engagement. Uh, it's important that uh, we don't leave anyone behind. So early adopters of battery electric technology have been uh, big fleets with uh, capital uh, to invest in new technology and try new technologies. But we also have many small fleets and independent owner operators in the region that need more support to help them with the transition. Um, also, um, we need to involve our frontline communities, environmental justice communities early on in decision making, uh, whether it be uh, related to the installation of charging uh, uh, station or site or any other issues. All right, next slide, please. Okay, I think that's it. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to take questions, uh, whether it's uh, later today or uh, by email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanuk. That was great. Um, and really a nice lead on or, or to our to our previous presentation. Um, with that, because we're running a little short on time, I'm gonna have our next poll question come up. And maybe we can have, we have any time at the very end um, for a couple questions, or of course, everyone has, you can contact us and we'll send out anybody who wants to get that contact. All right, so our last poll question today before we bring up our last speaker is, how can the electric utility support the build out of green infrastructure for this region? And um, our next speaker is gonna speak on that, but to get your thoughts, improving grid capacity, accelerating the build out time, supporting industries financially, um, advocating for clean energy programs or all of the above. So we'll just have a minute here and answering our question. All of the above. So again, nice little lob out there. Um, and we'll see what our utility is doing because our next speaker, Lisa Hanneman, is from Southern California Edison. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us. And yeah, we'll get started. Thanks so much, Kimberly, and thanks for having me. So we've heard a lot today, and this has been amazing to hear all the research that has been done um, the, from the perspective of what's going on in the transportation electrification sector. And, you know, SCE put out a white paper um, talking about our pathway to 2045. And as part of that effort, you know, it really took a, a look at what we need to accomplish to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the state of California, specifically in decarbonizing the transportation sector in Southern California. So, you know, when you look at what we're targeting, you know, we're targeting to electrify 26 million passenger cars, that's 75% of total fleet of light duty vehicles. Um, we're looking at 900,000 medium duty 
um, vans, trucks, shuttles, which is about 67% of vehicles on the road. And then looking at the heavy duty space, we need to electrify about 170,000 of those, which is about 38% of trucks and 85% of buses. And when we look at that, you know, basically what that achieves is decarbonizing the transportation sector by about 144 million um, metric tons of CO2 annually. But when you look at this, you know, achieving 2045 goals is significantly more difficult if we're not achieving the interim 2030 goals. So public awareness of EVs, the benefits associated with them, you know, there continues to be a lag in that. And so, you know, what we're trying to get to or trying to achieve is, you know, with light, medium and heavy duty vehicles moving towards electrification, you know, we need to look at model availability. We need to look at fueling infrastructure. And those two key things continue to be what the barriers are associated with adoption. And so, being able to address those barriers and really look at technology improvement as well as, you know, kind of diversifying of the customer base is so significant. And basically what this will do is start to drive down that price parity that we see between internal combustion vehicles and electric vehicles. But decarbonization, you know, it comes with a cost, but looking at incentives and pricing policies that target clean power opportunities, especially in vulnerable communities. So it helps prevent one customer group, you know, being disproportionately burdened. Um, it is crucial to assess the affordability and cost effectiveness on a total financial basis, not just by electricity rates. And so, you know, that's something that we want to drive towards when we look at you know, achieving this road to carbon neutrality. Next slide. So, you know, significant EV adoption is required to reach that pathway. You know, we saw that over three quarters of all passenger vehicles, 26 million of those need to be electric, two thirds of all medium duty vehicles and one third of all heavy duty vehicles are going to have to be um, transitioned to electric in order to achieve our goals. And one of the really critical things to, to think about is, you know, there's, there's really five factors that go into, you know, the timelines associated with building infrastructure, with preparing these vehicles to convert to electricity. And really most of those things is you know, the types of projects we're working on, you know, are we talking about only utility infrastructure? Are we talking about conversion of not only utility infrastructure, but also customer infrastructure that have to be upgraded to accommodate any of these changes? You know, some of the site characteristics, are we talking about underground utilities? Are we talking extensions of distribution lines? You know, what are, what are we doing there to help customers achieve that capacity, you know? Some of these projects are going to require a significant amount of capacity and increases in capacity. And one of the critical things there that we really want to highlight and make sure everybody's aware of is that, you know, some of those things may take additional time, upgrades to substations or, you know, load or reallocating load and moving around circuitry. You know, a lot of that, what we're here for is to partner. And so we really want to partner with customers as they're building these plans, as, you know, they're kind of adopting some of these goals. You know, we want to make sure that we're at the table right along with them. So we are prepared and the grid can be prepared for these changes as they occur. Um, you know, permits and clearances are something that we're seeing, you know, um, something that's taking time you know, whether that's permitting at the local level, federal level, state level, you know, it takes time to go through that process to continue that work. And so, you know, we really partnered with a lot of those jurisdictions to ensure that our packaging is created in line with whatever their goals are in submitting permits so that we could reduce some of that timeline associated with it. And then as everybody knows, and everybody's kind of seeing this is that, you know, materials and equipment 
you know, the long lead time, the shortages on key materials is still occurring in one of the roadblocks. So we want to make sure that we are planning for that, we're, we're prepared for that, and we're partnering with our customers as they kind of move in that direction. And now that we kind of talked high level about, you know, what needs to be done and what's required to read, you know, kind of reach those pathway goals, especially in the electric vehicle space, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the programs that we have available. So if you can go to the next slide. You know, a lot of what we've heard about is, you know, what are we doing to kind of drive you know, the affordability aspect of EVs. And so um, what we've done is created incentive programs that are available to our customers to take advantage of. And so some of the things that are available now are pre-owned electric vehicle rebates, um, $1,000 to $4,000 available to income qualified, um, $9 million to, you know, those with, you know, 6,000 EV owners, that's what we're putting into this program. Um, coming soon is an electric drayage truck rebate. Um, that's going to launch in late 2023. Our operators in our service area can get $150,000 rebate for a new class eight truck and $115,000 rebate for a new class seven truck by switching to electric. Um, new, you know, diesel trucks usually are in the range of $139 to $160,000. And so, you know, what SCE may do is adjust if the cost of these vehicles decline in order to serve more customers. But as of right now, as we look to early adoption, those are the incentives or rebates that we're offering. We're also offering in the medium duty, heavy duty, some financial assistance. It's a, it's a loan guarantee option that's available. That is also going to launch in 2023. It's available for financing new used and repowered commercial vehicles, anything class three and above, as well as charging stations for uh, businesses located in disadvantaged and rural communities. And then some drayage operators who take advantage of the rebate can use the um, the financing assistance to finance the rest of that new truck, whatever's left over. So whatever that gap is, they can leverage both. So these can be stackable. So you can use the rebate along with the loan. Next slide. As we transition to what we're doing in um, the light duty space, um, we also have a program, you know, programs available there um, for charging light duty. Um, this is still available to our disadvantaged community and new construction cu um, customers. So anything in the charge ready light duty space, that's anything workplace destination apartments and condos. So as long as you fall into a disadvantaged community or you're, you're building, you know, kind of ground floor up, those are still qualifying for, um, for our rebate program. And then we also have an infrastructure tariff program that we just launched um, recently. It's called Rule 29. Um, there is no limit on how many chargers can go in. It reduces the cost and simplifies EV infrastructure upgrades. You know, we pay for the design and the deployment of any of the EV electrical service extension work that has to be done on the SCE side of the meter. So that's all that can be captured under our Rule 29 program. Next slide. And then in our medium duty chart, we have a program card called Charge Ready Transport. Um, this is basically low to no cost electrical infrastructure. Um, we're looking at electrification of 8,000 plus uh, medium duty to heavy duty vehicles. Um, we also offer in conjunction with the infrastructure work, we actually offer rebates for the hardware for the charging stations themselves. And then as many of you may be aware, we rolled out special rates for EV fleets. Um, those EV rates actually create a demand neutrality for our customers. And what that does is it allows for low demand charges and you just pay a kilowatt hour charge for the time that you're utilizing the charging stations. And then we have advisory services too. And this is one of the things we want customers to take advantage. I go back to that partnership. You know, this is really an opportunity for us to come in and talk through grant assistance, do EV readiness studies, 
you know, figure out what needs to be done at your site from an infrastructure perspective so that we're aligned as you start to electrify your medium and heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. And so basically this is just a little more in depth. I know we're short on time, so I will just leave this slide here. I just wanna say it's a five-year program. There's $343 million in budget. And so this is something that we definitely wanna part partner with tran transit agencies, disadvantaged communities, all of those so that you know we can see this kind of grow and the success we can see within the transportation electrification space. And then the last slide is just um, a helpful um, link to our program so that you have that information. Thank you so much, Lisa, right on time. Um, unfortunately, this time we ran out of time. All this tells me is that we need another session talking about the uh, medium, the transition to the medium and heavy duty fleet. Um, so we'll have to plan on that and think about how we can continue this conversation another time. I'd like to thank our speakers once again for coming and sharing their knowledge, um, sharing all of the information they have for us. As we can see, it's an exciting time. Uh, it's a time of change and it's a time of big thinking, big thoughts, and we need everyone to put their heads into it. So I'd like to thank our speakers. I'd like to thank you all for attending. And if you have any questions or any follow-up, please just contact us and we'll contact the speakers and, and we'll get those answers to you. And I hope you'll join us at our next dialogue in August. We'll be looking at the connections between mobility and housing. Um, and so we'll be here back yeah, in two months time in Omnitrans, I hope you'll join us. Thank you very much, everyone.